Shine watched from the sidewalk as the two humans shook hands before stepping back a few paces from each other. The stocky one drew a bastard sword with a fat, bellied tip, calmly proclaiming, Drake is a better swordsman than the Scourge. The other, much thinner human, drew a long, thin rapier and donned a chainmail glove, softly rebuking, I believe the Scourge is a better swordsman to first blood. The stocky human nodded, a playful grin on his face. Try not to take one of my eyes out with one of those wild thrusts you're taught. The thinner human smiled back, returning a quip of his own. As long as you don't try and take my head off with those wide swings of yours. The two nodded in agreement. Then they clashed. The rapier jabbed at the stocky human's cheek, the stocky human twisting out of the way as the bastard sword's tip flashed inches away from the thin human's throat. The thin human countered by leaning back, throwing a left hook with the chainmail glove. The stocky man ate it, parrying the rapier that whipped for his side, before retaliating with a kick to the chest that sent the thinner man stumbling back with a laugh. They engaged again. The bastard sword swept upwards as the rapier swished down at an angle. The two blades met, and the heavier bastard sword pushed the rapier aside, the rapier redirecting the bastard sword slightly away from the thin man's face, locking the two chest to chest. Each other's blades locked at the crossguard before they broke away. The rapier thrusted, the bastard sword cleaved through the air. A line was cut on the stocky man's cheek, just as the tip of the bastard sword opened up a small, two-inch-long cut across the other's sternum. The two humans felt their injuries, saw the blood, and smiled. The stocky man sheathed his bastard sword and extended the hand he'd touched the cut with, blood on his fingers. Good work as always, Thomas. You're getting quicker with that needle of yours. Thomas smiled and shook the stocky man's hand with his own blooded one. I can say the same, Gary. That blade of yours is getting harder and harder to redirect, almost took my nose off with that upward swing. Gary smiled and gave a hearty laugh before clapping his friendly rival on the back. Let's go get a beer and compare notes then. Tangling up my sword guard with the basket hilt. Brilliant idea. The two humans' voices faded into the usual burble as everyone continued on with their day. Taking a moment to watch Gary and Thomas's weekly duel was a common pastime in the Forge district. Shine stopped by a food cart manned by a cephalopod who was selling fried octopus. Hey, Tingyak, get any confused tourists today that accuse you of cannibalism? There was a sound like a dozen suction cups being pulled off of one another, the cephalopod's version of laughter, the vendor's voice appearing in her head after a small pulse that she could accept or deny access to. A few, they seem to forget I'm a terrestrial squid and not a deep-water octopus. Besides, if I tasted anywhere near this good, I'd just lop a few feet of each limb off, fry it and sell it. They'd grow back in a day or two, and I'd save a ton on groceries. Shine laughed with Tignac, imagining the sight of him casually frying the end of one of his own tentacles. I don't doubt Tig, speaking of which. I'm visiting my old man, and you know how much he loves your cooking. She felt Tig's smile in her mind, even though the squid's face was completely unreadable. Just a very large eye staring back at her. Of course you know Frank and I go way back, have these on the house. Tig took a few fresh octopi, whacked them against the table to kill them instantly before starting to fry them up. It only took a few minutes for the many armed food cart manager to cook and box up a half dozen fried octopi. Shine took the box gratefully and bowed her head to Tig. Thank you, Tig, I owe you one. If you need anything, you know how to reach me. The cephalopod gave a salute with an unoccupied tentacle. No worries, Miss Stein. Please visit more often. I enjoy our little chats. Shine smiled and turned to walk off, using her nimble tail to drop a twenty-credit piece in Tignac's tip jar. It had been a while since she'd last seen her dad. Her job took her to some pretty faraway places for long periods. 
But whenever she knocked on his door, that tired old mouse always answered with gusto. Shine plodded her way down the main street, picking up some small material samples from the local smiths for her father's experiments. As she neared the warehouse, her father had converted into a machine shop and living quarters. She knocked on the door rather roughly, hearing a pneumatic hiss on the other side and the impact of metal against flesh. Without a second's more hesitation, Sheen ripped the door open, concern etched across her face. Shit, you good doc, that sounded like it hurt. The old Moosian was laughing, a bruise on his furless cheek where Ferric's new arm had punched him with pneumatic assistance. Ferric knelt by the laughing Moosian, a concerned look on his face as he swept his now gunmetal grey hair out of his eyes. Dr. Franklin Neville Stein simply patted the cyborg's still intact upper bicep, chuckling as he scratched one of his tattered ears. Ah, consider it a function check, my boy. That was barely at ten percent power, and it knocked me flat. Ferric looked down at his new arm and began chuckling with the mad doctor before pulling the much smaller Moussian to their feet. Doctor's orders unrefusable. Good work on the arm, though. If that was 10%, I can't imagine what 50 or 100 would have done. Dr. Frank nodded, the maniac glint of a mad scientist coming to his eyes. With the newly improved valves and better seals, you could punch a hole in starship armor at 70, 100, and you might just punch through the entire ship. The two old galactic adventures laughed together. Before Shine cleared her throat, the two men slowly, guiltily turned around as Shine gave them both a dirty look, hand slipping away from the handgun she kept at the small of her back. She pointed at her dad. We've discussed this, dad. Stay out of range of your own machines when you're working on them. She glared at Ferric, who sheepishly looked down. She did take a bit of pride in that. She was the only person he feared pissing off. And you. I told you not to let him work on your prosthetics while they're still attached. Do we need to have another Icarus scenario to deal with? Ferric mumbled back sheepishly. We only leveled the warehouse once. Shine slapped her palm against her face, dragging it down in exasperation before simply saying, Leveled it? Yeah, you've only done that once. However, you two have burned it down, shot bowling balls through the walls, created a miniature sun that bathed everything in lethal amounts of UV radiation after the containment field lost power. Or that time it got sucked into the warp because you two couldn't get it through your thick skulls why we don't open portals to the warp in atmosphere. You're extremely lucky neither of you got sucked in with it. Shine took a deep breath and let it out slowly before setting the box of fried octopus on the metal dinner table. The two old veterans of intergalactic conflicts hanging their head in shame after being berated by a journalist. Then Shine started snickering softly before saying, I love you both, but seriously, when you two get together, they seriously consider evacuating parts of the Forge District in case one of your guys' experiments goes awry. Again. Anyway, let's eat. I'm hungry. The two old men smiled at each other and gave a chuckle before joining Sheen at the table. Shine was munching on the fried tentacle of an octopus when Ferric turned to her father. How's the artificial black hole coming along? Swimmingly, it just stabilized last night and is ready for observer. The two men were distracted from their conversation by Shine slamming her head into the table. Her voice muffled as she stated, You two are the dumbest fucking geniuses I know. Dad, please, for the love of God, get rid of the black hole. Dr. Frank sheepishly looked between Ferric and his daughter. Ferric shrugged as if to say, Might as well be honest, old man. Clearing his throat, Dr. Frank sheepishly replied, Sweetheart, it's a black hole. The most I can do is keep it stable until it runs out of energy. Sheen looked at her father. And how long will that take? Her father grimaced. More, more than 250,000 years, give or take. Shine just groaned as she lowered her head back to the table, quietly muttering to herself. 
How can they be so smart yet so dumb at the same time? Thank God neither of them care about intergalactic domination. Ferric turned back to Dr. Frank, a smile creeping onto his face as he overheard Shine's mumblings. So how's the manifesto going, Frank? For the love of fuck you two, just be normal for five seconds! The exasperated reporter cried out, sending both Ferric and Dr. Frank into howls of laughter as she finally realized they were fucking with her. You two are insufferable. One of these days you're going to give me an aneurysm with your antics. She chuckled and shook her head. Glad you didn't actually make a black hole, Dad. The two men's laughter suddenly stopped and they shared a glance. Shine pinched her nose and sighed defeatedly. Scratch that. I think I just had one. I'm going home before you two summon some eldritch horror or something.